thing which he studied Romance literature and linguistics at the Ludwig Maximilian University, which is an Erasmus partner university of our department, and computer science at the Technische Universität, both in Munich. Um, his PhD was on databases and logic programming in Zurich, Switzerland. Since 1991, he has worked at the Institute of Phonetics and Speech Processing at uh, the LMU in Munich. His research, developing software for processing spoken language, online perce perception experiments. This is how we met a year ago when I had research uh, that had to um, and, 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 and I was looking into online an online experiment and uh, Christoph basically set it up for me. And crowd-based transcription of speech. And currently, Christoph is also involved as an external advisor in a research project at the university in Modena in our German section about spoken language. I guess this is enough for the moment and I would like to invite Christoph to take over. Thank you very much. Maybe you also say you might say something about tomorrow about the workshop the tutorial which we offer tomorrow. Yeah I, I will yes. Okay just a second. I will open uh, the screen. I have to check yes audio is on. And you should now see a big, simply the presentation, web tools and I added and services for phonetic research and speech processing. I have to clean up a little bit. Okay. So, um, yes, this is part of a two, see, or yes, we have planned two uh, presentations. One today is an introduction and I will simply, simply highlight some of the tools that we developed. And tomorrow there will be a tutorial where we, we will actually do more than what is presented today. Uh, today we're not going to present recording and we're not going to talk about uh, transcription. This is something we will be doing tomorrow, but tomorrow you will also uh, use some of the services I present today. It will be not a very theoretical presentation today. Um, this is, yeah, maybe it leads you to think that this is just a little bit of programming that has been done to get uh, some phonetic work done. But actually it is uh, something like the implementation of phonetic ideas. So we're always looking at what do we want to achieve? How do we want to get there? How can we implement what we know about uh, phonetics and speech processing? And how can we make this as easy to use as possible? So this was always our idea. And actually, I will come back to this a few more times. What we have developed here originally was mainly used for phonet by phoneticians. But now, since working with spoken language anal analysis of spoken language has become so easy, technically easy, not from the not in terms of uh, the content, but at least from the technology or the use of technology behind it, that other research disciplines are now increasingly using these tools. So one area where we are currently uh, expanding into or where we have attracted some attention is the area of oral history. This is where we have interviews from special events in human history where people talk about this, where they have their very personal way of talking about these events and talking about past times. And this is an area which actually has started to use our tools more and more, which in our case, again, has led to extending our tools and making them more robust. You must imagine phonetics, phoneticians in the early days, they had a few sentences, they were analyzing like, du hast Piepe gesagt, du hast Pupe gesagt, and then they looked at, they had these carrier sentences and some words in between, 
and this is what they were looking at. So a few seconds of speech and then came oral historians and oral historians come with two hours of interviews. And suddenly our tools were confronted with two hours of speech data. And this at first didn't work very well, but over the time, over time we have managed to uh, actually solve this issue and all our tools are now capable both of working for very small signals and for very large signals. And you'll see a few of these things. So actually what is what you will be seeing today is uh, years of work in speech processing frozen or like went into some software. And I'm going to present a lot of this software today. Okay, first you will hear something. This is the general way of presenting speech. If you look at any of these um, criminal series like CSI and so on, whenever there's an audio recording, they will show you something like this. And it has become like an icon for spoken language. If you listen carefully, you will hear a German person saying, reading Italian sentences and it will be not difficult for you to see who this speaker was. Dopo le quattro la stanchezza comincia a farsi sentire. In, Ge in Germania il tempo è sempre instabile. A Graz va molto di moda il prosecco. Ok. So although there were five sentences, I just presented three, and you immediately will notice, oops, this is not an Italian speaker. But how can you tell? Well, you have your feeling about this, and if you know something about language, you might find, you might know that phonemes in this sentence are not pronounced the way you would expect. So, especially my R, is quite different from what Italians speak, how Italians pronounce the R. Timing is probably not the same. I probably have a German timing in Italian sentences. And although I try to, sometimes it switches between the two. And then prosody is probably quite different. Prosody intonation. So the contour of the sentence is quite different. So this is something you will immediately notice, but as scientists, we would like to do this a bit more precisely. We would like to have a detailed look at these deviations and maybe even measure them. And to do this, to measure such deviations, we need speech processing technology. And this is what the talk is going to be about. So we developed web services and tools for speech processing they are offered by the Bavarian Archive for Speech Signals. This is where I work. And what they do, these web services, is they provide easy access to powerful speech processing technology. You no longer have to be worried about installing tools and technical details. Sometimes you might not even be allowed to install new tools on your computer because it belongs to university. Sometimes some of these tools need a lot of technical expertise to get them running. This is no longer needed if you can make use of the web services. The web services are intended for researchers and scholars. So people from engineering, electrical engineering, computer science, but also from language sciences, history, they may all use these tools. They all work with spoken language, so we have very few linguistic tools. This is something partly intended and partly uh, coincidental. We have little linguistic expertise at our institute. We have a lot of in, uh, competence in spoken language, and this is where our tools end. So we do a lot of spoken language processing, and at the end, you will probably want to continue with some linguistic processing. So have a look at the syntactic structure, have a look at semantics and so on. But this is something we do not do in our web tools, but we're open to this kind of processing. As you will see in a diagram later on, 
we offer many, many different output formats that you can use for any other or for many other tools. Spoken language is universal. That's why we include wherever possible support for many languages. And as I said before, for many domains, so it's not only phonetics, but it's also ethnology, dialectology, and so on. All of these may use these tools. And the best is with your academic account in Europe, you may use these services and tools for free. So this is really cool. Once you have logged in uh, to your university and opened the web services, you may there's only one place where you will have to log in again. This is when you're using automatic speech recognition, but all the other um, tools are free to you as an academic user. And even automatic speech recognition is free. We simply have to make a second uh, authentication uh, because we're relying on third party providers like Google or Fraunhofer Institute and they do not make their services open for anybody, but only with a limited, uh, yeah, with limited access. Okay, so easy access is one of our main goals for researchers, free for academia, spoken language, many languages. This was hopefully the motivation and this is a short outline of what you will be seeing. So I will talk a little bit about Clarin, which is a European infrastructure research network, research infrastructure network. I will shortly present the Bavarian archive and then I will go to the web services. And today I will present three tools out of 70 or out of 20 web services. So we have many, but I think these are the most interesting and there will be a summary. So what is Clarin? Clarin is a network within Europe. We have 21 participating countries. We have three observer countries, France, South Africa, and the UK. And we have one associate member, the Carnegie Mellon University in the US. This is on the right side, you see what Clarin offers. There's this portal which tells you what is available. Then there's a depositing service, which is actually something you should really be thinking of when you're doing research with spoken language and even with large corpora of text language. If you create a corpus, if you create a database of spoken language, think of making it available via Clarin. And even think of doing this very early, even if before you have finished working with the data, because then other people will see the data you are working with. They will be able to work with this data and it will very much increase your academic visibility and contribute yeah, to your work being seen in the world. So as a Clarine Center, we also have a repository. I will show this very briefly and not go into details here. Clarine has a so-called virtual language observatory. Many of you probably use Google to find specific data in the internet, but Google is, does not discriminate. So if you're looking for a particular speech recording, Google will give you everything with this, with the search string in its name or in its title. The Virtual Language Observatory is much more precise. It's a tool designed to look for data in the different Clarine repositories that are available. So you have some faceted search. You can restrict your search to spoken language, to German or Italian, and provide containing this and this kind of items. So it's a much more precise search than Google. Yes, you get this easy access to protected resources. You have to only register once. There is this language resource switchboard, which is also a nice idea. Once you have started using a tool, it will recommend the tools that you may use after this because they fit together. 
You can have virtual collections. So for your own personal work, you can kind of define your own desktop where you put the data that you're interested in into one place. So you always know when coming back to this virtual collection, this looks like a corpus to you, but it may the data may come from many different corpora. And there's an inventory of what is available in different languages. We have this virtual language observatory, which is searching in metadata, and we have content search. So you can even search within corpora from the Clarine web page. And of course, there are questions and answers for help. So it's really powerful what Clarine offers you. And I can only recommend having a look at it. In Germany, although we have, um, I wrote here, we have eight centers. There are a few more in this little map. The ones with the uh, bold colors, they are the Clarin centers proper. So Berlin, that's, the, that's an academy, Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Sciences. In Hamburg, we have a center working on spoken language resources. Leipzig is the computer science department. In Mannheim, we have the Institut für Deutsche Sprache, which is a very, very large institution with a state uh, funded by the state to actually document the contemporary German as it is presented in newspapers and in broadcast and in speech. So they have huge corpora and are opening them up to the research community. Munich, we are here for spoken language mainly with a focus on speech processing, but also, as I said before, with new um, research domains. Saarbrücken is working on text corpora. They have a beautiful collection, for example, of the Old Bailey, uh, that was the judicial court in, the, in Britain. I think it's the main court where all the very important cases are being uh, discussed. And they have a documentation starting back a few hundred years ago and everything has been digitized and everything has been uh, processed. You can, it's a, now an XML document where you can search about, yeah, juris, uh, juridical processes starting, I don't know when, I think 1500 or so, everything is there. Stuttgart works on political science that's their specialization, but they have a lot of historical corpora again for uh, with spoken language and Tübingen is the coordinator. As I said before, Munich, Hamburg and Mannheim focus on spoken language. Each of us, our centers has a specific uh, region of interest. Us in Munich is phonetics and spoken language, uh, phonetics and speech processing, sorry. Okay, the Bavarian Archive of Speech Signals was funded in 95. The idea was at that time, there were a lot of European projects to collect data to allow industry to develop automatic speech recognition systems for everyday use. So this was the time when they started to think that voice, assistant, voice assistants could be a nice thing where speech recognition was regarded as one of the key te uh, technologies. And it was a change, a fundamental change in the way speech research was done. Very early speech research was basically something very much connected to logic. So they said language and logic are very similar. We try to analyze the meaning of sentences by applying logic processes. And then people were seen from today, people were rather naive and they said spoken language works the same way. So they tried to have a rule-based approach to recognizing speech and it failed totally. It's the same problem that actually phoneticians had when they started to look at speech phones, phonemes in the 1780s, 1790s with the beginning of the scientific uh, revolution when they thought that speech was simply like letters being connected to each other in a very linear way. 
So once you can find the ideal shape of an A, you can put it anywhere and it will sound like an A. And then suddenly they found out in 19, very early in the 19th uh, century, uh, 20th century, when they first X-ray photo uh, films of people speaking were available. And they suddenly saw there is nothing like a prototypical A in speech or a prototypic, prototypical other phoneme. It's always different depending on who speaks, how fast he or she speaks, in what combination these sounds occur. And this is something you saw in the very first introduction, the example where we had these curves. From these curves, nobody can recognize what is being said. So simply looking at these curves might tell you how many syllables there are. It's the number of clouds you see, but it will not give you enough information to actually recognize what is being said. You need other tools. So in 1995, there was a change of paradigm, speech recognition change to statistical methods, and this suddenly really made it work. There's also a very mean uh, saying by one of the leading experts in speech recognition at the time. He said, every time I fire a linguist, speech recognition goes up 10%. So the old knowledge about speech or the way speech was being processed or language was being processed, the linguistic way did not work for speech. Now we know that this is not true. We need phonetic knowledge to understand how speech works, but we have to combine it with statistical approaches. Okay, this was, sorry for this large deviation. Uh, we are located at the Institute of Phonetics and myself and Florian Schiel, we run the bus. Within Clarine, we have a repository of more than 50 speech corpora. We offer these web services and as Ulrike Kanzner said, we offer also consultancy to speech related projects. This is our repository. And as you can see, there are a lot of green entries. It's only a screenshot, so I'm not able to browse in this list. But uh, everything that's green, you can download immediately once you've logged in. For example, we have this very first corpus. It's a corpus pr uh, produced by one of our master students. It's called Absolventinnen. Uh, in Germany, we have this discussion at the moment of gender neutral speech. So in orthography, we start to include a capital I within the words such as Freundin. So we have Freund and Freundin. And in many cases, uh, there are discussions at the moment to be more inclusive in speech. So they try to add or to change orthography in some way to symbolize that not only male and female people are uh, included, but anybody. So they start with new, yeah, either using a capital I or some people use a star or an underscore. And there are very, very actually ferocious discussions going on on which way to use this. This is one aspect. How do we write things? But nobody knew how to speak these new words. And if you carefully listen to uh, radio broadcasts, especially in uh, broadcasts by students or young people, you will see that they try to make a difference between the traditional female form and the gender neutral form. And you will all very often notice something like a small pause, so they will not say absolventinnen, but absolventinnen, something like that. I was exaggerating. And this student actually wanted to measure this. What is happening? How can we distinguish the form with a capital I spoken from the form with smaller eyes? And we found, he found interesting things. People are trying, some people are trying to avoid this. So they find strategies on yeah, either avoiding it completely or simply present the male form as they used to. So there's ongoing sound change, very interesting, and we have a corpus documenting this. 
ALK is one of the corpora. When we talk about it, everybody says, I want to join, because here we tested people under the influence of alcohol. Actually, in Bavaria, judges and policemen, they have to, within their education or within their yeah, within their education at university, they have to do a drinking test under medical supervision. And from medical points of view, this test is no longer interested. People now know how much you can drink and so on. It's meant as a personal experience for judges to see how much personal judgment is influenced by alcohol. When we started this, we were wondering a little bit whether judges are also supposed to smoke some dope or anything, but in Bavaria, it's limited to alcohol. And we recorded this. And as I said before, people always want to join this corpus until I tell them that actually blood tests are taken. So there's a breath test and a blood test. And this, yeah, then people no longer are so interested to participate, but it's a wonderful corpus. We tried to find out what happens when people get intoxicated and surprising things happen. Half of the people speak, at least unto a given alcohol level, they speak more precisely than in colloquial speech without alcohol, probably to hide the fact that they've been drinking and others don't care and they actually start to speak in a more blurry way and so on. So we have a lot of these corpora. Have a look at the catalog. It's simply wonderful what you can find there. We also have some Italian corpor corpora. We have a corpus of uh, Southern Italian and uh, yeah, other interesting corpora. <clears throat> okay, now to what I actually wanted to present. This repository is, sorry. <clears throat> this repository is part of what we're doing. The other part and the one I will be talking about today is the web services. This is what you see when you get there. But first, we have to think a little bit about what we want to do. So if we do speech processing, first of all, we record data. Then normally we have to transcribe it. Either this can be done automatically or it has to be done manually. Sometimes if we ask people to read sentences, we can skip the transcription because we know what was said. Remember the sentences I presented to you, I knew what I was supposed to say, so I could skip, I was able to skip automatic speech recognition and or manual transcription, which is not really true because if you listen carefully, you heard that in the second sentence, I made an error. It was uh, in Germania, the weather is always uh, bad, uh, unstable. And I said in, Ger in Germania. So there was a, an error while I spoke. So manual transcription would have been necessary. But in the ideal case where I have read speech, I can go directly to segmentation. Segmentation means I have my speech signal and I want to know where each word occurs. And this can be done automatically. This was until a few years ago, the most tedious work for phoneticians. I will say a few words about this later on. Once we have the segmentation, we know where every sound in the sentence occurs. We know where every word in the signal occurs. We can then either download the results to our operating system, or we can use statistical processing, or we can put it into databases and then do our final analysis. So we can either have perception experiments, we can do some present presentations in the browser, we can do phonetic analysis using a very clever tool, or we can use Prat or Elan or any of these tools. How many of you know Prat? How many of you know, know Elan? Prat is a tool developed by Paul Boersma for phonetic analysis. It's the standard tool that every phonetician has been using for years. And Elan is a tool where you can do a video analysis. And what's nice both about Prat and Elan is that they have several layers of information. So we have the video or sound, and then we have 
one transcript perhaps for words, the other one for speech sounds. And then in the case of video, we have, we have some annotation of the gestures by the speaker and so on. This is what Elan does and Prat is the same for spoken language. So very powerful tools. And this is normally where you do in-depth analysis of the data that you have. The problem is all these are different tools with different data formats. And to use something like the automatic segmentation when it was first invented required a lot of technical expertise. We offered the mouse service, which is the Munich automatic segmentation very early on from 2000 on as something you could install in your own location, but only four or five people in the whole world did this because it was so difficult to do. You need a lot of expertise to do this. Very few people had speech recognition running on their own computer and even doing transcription. This was a bit easier, but was still complicated enough. So every tool has its own interface. Every tool has its own requirements in terms of data. Some tools, for example, Prat, would allow you to export data into other formats, but they would accept only one format as input, which was very difficult to reuse your data. So this was the situation and we were not happy with this. So what we try to do is to provide a website where all of these different tools are well, we're not replacing them. We integrate them into this website. Sometimes we use the same tools. We use the same mouse systems. We use automatic speech recognition. We use manual transcription, but we hide it behind the website. And you do not have to wor worry about interfaces or data formats because the data you produce, you upload your data, get it processed, download it, analyze it, correct it maybe, and then you can upload it again and the formats that you use will be understood by the web page and it will allow you to use them for further steps. So it has become really easy to use. You don't have to install any software on your computer. You can go directly to the web page and use all of these tools without, as I said, technical knowledge. You need, of course, domain knowledge. You knew, need to know what these tools are for. They do not do this work for you. They do not do the scientific work for you. They do the manual work for you, the, the technical work. They are reliable. It's always there. And they are, the results are accountable. So when you present your results, you can say, I pre processed my data using the web services and part of the results of the web services, we always give you the configuration parameters and the version of the software that you used. So later on when presenting your work and discussing your work, you can say this was produced with web mouse version so and so and with the following parameters so that you, somebody else can reproduce these results, which is also very nice. Finally, it's efficient. Some of these tools are really fast because we have a lot of computing power and yeah, it's easy for you. And there's a very nice mode as well. We call it the email notification. If you don't want to wait for the results, for example, if you have a few hours of oral history interviews to process, you can start this in the evening and ask the web services to send you an email when it's done. And then you get an email with a link and all, you can then download all your, your data in one. So this is the interface that you see. And I would really like to strengthen this point. It's not a replacement for further analysis. It's simply all the technical work we can do here. We can do some of the scientific analysis as well, but your work, the presentation, online experiments, further analysis is still your work. So we're not taking away the scientific work from you, but simply we make getting there easier. Okay, so this is the page. I will now 
go through quickly some of the pages that you see so that you understand what I will be presenting then. I will show you how the pages, uh, what you find in the page, and then I will use some of the services. First of all, you have a list of services. We have, I think, 16 services here. We have general help. We have a list of publications. So if using, when using our services, we would like to ask you to cite our work because we need academic credits for this. And yeah, let's continue. So we have 16 services. Web mouse is the automatic segmentation. This is a something like a phoneme aligner. Gra grapheme to phoneme. This one is for uh, metadata creation and so on. I will not go into detail here. Some of you, might, some of these might be quite interesting when you're working with, with video, as Ulrike Kanzner is in her group. We could also automatically, from the segmentation, we could automatically produce subtitles for the videos, which is quite nice. Then you can not only listen to the video, but also get the text here. For some of the transcription work, it might be useful to have a voice activity detection to find out where there is something in the signal. For oral history, for example, it is quite important to have an anonymization service. People talk about their very personal history and sometimes they actually start talking about, let's call them bad things that happened in the past, past or illegal things that some of their kids have been up to and so on. So what we can do here is simply remove all the words that should not be there. So basically all the names, place names, person names, automatically from the speech. You can still know what's going on, but no more personal details here and so on. And something I would like to show you today is the pipeline service. We have two of them, one with speech recognition, the other one without. They actually automate a lot more than the single services. If you find that something is missing that you need in your work, let us know, because we're always looking for new applications. Actually, subtitle, activity detection, anonymizer, they were not phonetician tools in the beginning. They came, they were asked, we were asked to implement them by people from other domains like social sciences and oral history. So for every service you have, or for the web page as a whole, sorry, you have a general help. We have some videos, YouTube videos on how to use this. We have frequently asked questions. We have a lot of use cases. We have example files that you can use. We have some hints for developers because you can, the graphical user face is not the only way in which you can use the web services. We have the versions of different tools. So if you want, you can go back to some other version. Descriptions why and how you may use these services and contact addresses. These are the videos and so on. So this is available for every, for all the tools. Then we have a list of publications, most of them in PDF format. And as I said before, it's essential that you cite us because yeah, we need these credits to get further funding. And this is a list of service. You saw this on the right side. Uh, we, play, we put a little, well, it's not a game, but they are presented in random order on our web page. So that every time you open the web page, you see a new selection simply to show you how many there are. You can also go to the list of items and yeah, there they, there they are presented always in the same order. You can select your favorite services, the ones that you've been using recently, they will always be at the top of the list. And the ones with the little lock mean that you have to log in to use them. They are all the services that involve automatic speech recognition. Okay. And this is what an individual service looks like. On the left side, you have basically this gray, this area marked in gray, where you can drag your files. 
Then you have some options to choose from. You have a description of the particular service here, and you have this very important status bar. This tells you whether everything worked or not. Then you have, of course, the small print, meaning that you've read our terms of usage and so on, and then you can start the service. This is your, what you will be seeing with every service that there is. Here you can simply drop, as I'm doing here, your files into this area. It will tell you what kinds of files it accepts. Some of them are file extensions you might have never heard of. Some of them you might be familiar with. So a lot of services allow many different file formats and you simply drop them here and then select the language that you want to use and select an output format. I will show this in a few minutes. A red error background means something went terribly wrong. It didn't work. So in this case, I tried to run a service without having uploaded the files. The interesting thing is you can actually upload hundreds of files in one go. And then these web these error messages might become very difficult to read. So you can copy this to a clipboard and then use your text editor to quickly search for the patterns in the error messages to see what went wrong. And if it's green, everything worked very well. In this case, upload was successful and you get, yeah, you get the status message. And if you click on the little plus, you will see more information about the particular service the particular message. Okay, I will now go to a demo and first show automatic speech recognition. As I said before, I read these five sentences and although they should contain what there was, and actually they do with some little errors in them, I will have automatic speech recognized recognition, recognize what, what, what I said. So it's surprise, it works surprisingly well for my German accent. So probably because I'm using a German speech recognition engine. Then I will use the Munich automatic segmentation and try to find the segments within the signal. Then I will use the anonymizer to remove some of the words from my audio file and then these are individual tools. Then I will show you the pipeline where all these tools are run in one step. And finally, if we have time, we can do some orthographic transcription, but otherwise this will be the topic for tomorrow's tutorial. So, are you still with me for the services? Let's start with automatic speech recognition. Here we have this, what I said before, user email notification. Sometimes some speech recognition providers take rather long to respond. We, since we are using their publicly available services and in general, we're not paying for them, we're always the last in the queue. So if they have a commercial con, uh, contract, then they will first serve the commercial people and then we get yeah, the rest of their processing power and this might take time. So if we put our email address here, we will get a notification that work has been done. We have the languages, we have about uh, 10 languages at the moment in speech. No, we have more languages in speech recognition because Google offers speech recognition for very many languages. But these are basically, we have a, only a limited number of uh, speech recognition providers. We can ask the web pay, the web services to automatically select one of the providers, or you can do this manually. You can define the output format. Diarization, is an interesting service, especially if you're having dialogues. It tries to assign tags to every part of the speech signal depending on who's speaking. So in a discussion or in a dialogue, you will get speaker A, speaker B, speaker A, speaker B, and what they said. And 
some automatic speech recognition providers give this information, others don't. So, yeah, you can test. It's not very reliable, unfortunately. If we know the number of speakers, this also helps the automatic speech recognition. If we know who is speaking, we put, can put some speaker labels here. And you can also buy processing power at our lab. So with this, you can climb the priority ladder and get your work done. We have only limited quota for free speech recognition by all of these providers. But if you pay, then you can, we can get unlimited uh, processing power, at least for Google. So this is quite nice. If you know that you have a lot of stuff to do, then ask us, we will give you a key and then send you a bill afterwards. It's about five euros per hour of speech. So which is not too much. And with Google, you get one of the best speech recognizers. So it's worth thinking about this. Okay, these are the services, the options that we have. And this is the result. Dopo le quattro, la stanchezza comincia a farsi sentire. Okay, so it, actually this is what the speech recognition produced. And this was the sentence, you can see this, this is my false start. You st still hear it, but speech recognition omitted this. They said, oh, this is not important for the sentence, this is what, oh, sorry. In, Ger in Germania, il tempo è sempre instabile. So you could see this first false start and then the, the real sentence. But this is one of the problems of automatic speech recognition. They try to smoothen the sentence. So anything that it finds that's not correct will be removed. And as scientists, this is terrible for us because we actually, we're interested in all these little problems during speech because this is where really something happens, where people start thinking, where they have some, yeah, where something interesting happens. The smooth stuff is probably not interesting. Interesting are the deviations and so on. So this is what we get as a result, but we don't know where these words were spoken. We simply know this is the text, but we have no idea where the words, of course, they occur one after the other. So this one will be dopo and this one will be sentire, but we don't know where they begin and where they end. This is what web mouse does. We have the string of words and then we can measure or we can calculate where these words occur. Web mouse, and this was one of the very, very time consuming tasks in the old days. It took 500 to 1,200 times as long as the audio. And people who have transcribed or who have done phonetic transcriptions know that these numbers are true. Uh, they might sound exaggerated, but it's really hard work. If you only do word segmentation, it's quicker. But if you do this for individual sounds, it might be that long. We can now do this not in real time, but very quickly, fully automatically for 20 languages. We can set some par parameters. We have different output formats and the automatic procedure is about 75% as good as humans are. There is no absolute truth in annotation and transcription. So we have to compare this to human performance, which is also not perfect. And there we measured about 95 of human performance for web mouse. You upload pairs of files. So you upload the text file and the audio file. You can upload many of them. In this case, I said it's Italian. I want Prat as output format. And then I ran the service. There's a nice trick. If you have a language that is not yet supported by mouse, we have one mode where you can use a language independent mode, then all we need is some kind of a phonemic transcription, what was said, or, and this might sound a bit, yeah, preposterous, simply use German. The German sound model is the best developed by our tools, 
And actually, we get a lot of languages to sound very much or to segment them with the German model works very well. So Japanese and Scottish English, they are better than using, uh, Scottish English is better than using the British English if we use the German setting. And we did not have a language model for Japanese. We tried German and it worked very well. So if you find the results are not satisfactory, play. And this is really nice because you can now, because it's so quick, you can actually play with all these settings. You can try this, you can try this and see what works best. In the old days, you had to invite, invest 500 times. Of course, you got the right results, but now you can do this very quickly and simply check what you want, what suits you best. And then you can use these settings for, for the future. So this is the third example of my Italian sentences. I'm not going to read them again, but now you can see that we know that where every word occurs. And not only every word, but for example, for stanchezza, you can see the individual sounds. And as you can see, the A, the E, and the A, you can see how different they are. They have the general shape of a vowel here, but they are very different in terms of length. So they both are very similar and on the other hand, quite different. And from this curve alone, you could not distinguish an F from an S or a SH. We know these plosives, the K and the T are quite similar. This is the typical Italian, the Geminata stanchezza with a small actual real gap in between. So with some phonetic knowledge, you learn to read these in a better way. But as I said before, we still cannot determine exactly what was being said, but these boundaries are computed automatically. And this is what human transcribers would also give you. So now, and this is why I tried this example. Now you can actually start measuring how long are the symbol of the sounds what frequency do they have? And if we had Italians reading the same sentences, we could start computing differences. And this is where we get a hand on, a grip on the differences on variation and do our, the analysis that we're actually interested in. And then we also can export all the data into other formats. And this is what I think for serious scientific work, this is the most interesting part of the tools. We have formats for presentation, like the one you saw before, or we have formats for calculation. So if you simply export data as comma separated values, you can download them and use them in R or in Excel for your computations. I put Excel here just for you to know. Uh, that you can use it, but of course, it's not sufficient for statistical analysis. You would do this with R, but very often it's a very convenient way of presenting data in table format. And Excel offers you a lot of formatting here. You can even do some diagrams and show you the distribution and so on. We also have annotations for further processing. So this is a JSON format that most programming languages so directly support and where you get all the relevant information in a machine readable format. And it's always the same data. So what you saw here, what you saw here, and what you see on the right side, it's always the same basic format, but we have different representation, different output formats. Okay, I will now switch to the to the tools. And now we are in the, on the web page, the bus web page. I promised you this interface. I will remove all these here. So this is where you see the general help and the publications. Okay, I see I have to be a bit quick. So let's go back to the home. And I will select web mouse, uh, ASR first. Okay, it will now ask me for authentication.
Okay, and now I can use automatic speech recognition. I will select my audio files. and simply drag them here. Oh. And this is where you see the green status message. It has worked. These are short files, so I don't need a email notification. We're talking, these are all the languages that are supported. Most of them are, pro, are supported by Google and I have to warn you, only the very big languages are well supported. Italian actually is well supported. And let's take, let's take text as the output format. And that's all we need. And then I run the service. Okay, it's done. So the five sentences were well recognized. And you can see it worked well. Okay, now we have, normally I would download this as a zip file and have on my computer the results of the automatic speech recognition. Now, since I have the text file and the audio file, I can switch to the next service, namely web mouse. I will take the simple one, web mouse basic, and I will take again the audio files and the text files that I got. Again, I drop them here, upload, Okay, I will go again to Italian and I will use the text grid format for output. I have a few other formats. So I have an Elon file, I have a spreadsheet file and I even have TEI text encoding initiative. Okay. Again, I can download this. I can even have a look at it in the browser. And here you will see that Stenkezza comincia quattro dopo You could now hear it. I selected all the A's, but they're all different. So this was dopo le quattro. But, but, this is the but, A in, where is the, oh, the A in Stanket is very, very short. The, At the, the end. The, 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 the. So they are all different, and this is what phoneticians are interested in. If you're not interested in the phonetic detail, also this information is very valuable, simply because it allows you to, yeah, when I, talk, when I said about the deviations from my pronunciation to a native Italian deviation, you would probably look at words and look at the sentence and check the contour of speech. Okay. So now we had two of these services, the web mouse and the automatic speech, uh, automatic speech recognition and web mouse. As you see, it was a story of uploading files, running the service and downloading files. And sometimes the processing chain is longer than this. So 
it would be nice if we could do all of this in one go. And this is the next service I will show. So we'll go back to the home page and have a look at the pipeline with automatic speech recognition. I don't have to register again because I'm still registered. I'm now being quick. So what I do now, again, the first thing, I'll take only the audio files. Drag it here. Upload as I did before. And then I have to select one of the many pipelines. In our case, it is automatic speech recognition, which gives me the words. Then I select grapheme to phoneme conversion, which means I translate every orthographic word to its phonemic representation, like in a pronunciation dictionary. And then I generate the segmentation where every word and where every sound in the file occurs. I have many more. I can do the syllabification and for longer files I can chunk this into pieces I don't have to do this I don't have to worry about this I simply have to select the pipeline I have to know what these pipelines are but then this will be done automatically for me so I selected speech recognition grapheme to phoneme connect uh, conversion and mouse again Italian this is my output format and in case you were one, now you didn't see these before. There are many options. We show you only the most important ones here, but there are many, many more you can use. And in our case, for example, I would like to see the beautiful phonetic symbols that we have in the phonetic alphabet. So I check to change, sorry, change to IPL, IPA alphabet. And I will run the service again. Okay. To you, it might look very similar, and actually it is, but we had only one step, one upload action, and then everything until the final result was automatically done by the pipeline. And now you can see, let's have a look at, well, this is not very interesting. This one is a bit more interesting tempo because it uses a, the phonetic alphabet. So we have the nice phonetical symbols like the E here for tempo. And the segmentation actually is quite good. This is the T. So there's nothing and then the burst of the plosive. And this is everything happens in the browser, which is really spectacular. This segmentation viewer was implemented by a colleague at our lab. And it's, yeah, it's a fascinating piece of technology that he developed. Actually, you can do everything that, almost everything that you can do in Prat within a browser. Okay. Again, I can download everything to my file. So what you've seen so far was first three services in, or two services separately, and then a pipeline that combines everything. I will go back to my presentation. So you've seen this or you've almost guessed it. Why did we develop these uh, motivations? Of course, we thought that our web services already were perfect to use, but then non-technical users came and said, it's still much too complicated. We have to select one service after the other. We have to upload and download all the time. 
So could you please simplify this? And then we had this idea to combine everything into one service, and that's the pipeline that came out of it. There's only one upload action needed. All the default options are already set. You still have access to the expert options if you want, but the ones that are most commonly used and that make sense are available. And you have this notification. If it takes longer, then you can go home and for breakfast, you get the email that everything's been done. And this has actually led to our services being used by other domains, research domains, like sociology and oral history, as I said before. Okay, this, are, this is a list of some of the services. And now to show again our example from this little bit of audio, we get this informational part of data with a different representation, representation in one single step. Okay, uh, besides the graphical user interface, we also have a programmatic interface. This, here we introduce again some of the technical stuff. Uh, many software tools like EMU, uh, yeah, like EMU, like Exmeralda or like Elan, they actually use our services. You can use the mouse service directly from Elan. There is a menu option speech recognition, which is a bit of a misnomer. And this actually gives you the mouse services within Elan. So you can use it directly from external tools. And if you have some tools or if you are developing your tools, you can use this programming interface and integrate this into your own workflow, into your own tool. And I encourage you to do this because it really helps you for a lot of services. Tomorrow we will see how WebMouse and ASR are integrated into the editor Oxtra. Okay, this is the final slide. So what did I not show to today? I didn't show how we do recording with speech recorder. And there's even a more ad advanced example. We also can do speech recordings via the web in a system called Wiki Speech. Tomorrow in the tutorial, we will be using Speech Recorder. Then there will be an autographic transcription with Optra. I didn't show this today. We have, I said this before, the web services, non-technical access to powerful speech technology. And I cannot stress this enough. It is free, use it really make use of it. And a lot of people are using it already. And if you find something is missing from our list of services, if you have some special requirements, let us know and we'll see whether we can develop a service. Most of the services I showed you today were developed upon user request. We started with WebMouse and ASR and all the other services came from user requests. So we listen and when we find that we can do it, we will try to do it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Christoph. Actually, I was one of those users, right? Who contacted you and said, I, you know, can you help me? I need to set up an, ex an online experiment. And um, well, it was a year ago. Yes. <laughs> Are there any questions, any comments? And of course, we would also like to ask you who is interested in participating tomorrow at our tutorial, our Christoph's tutorial. Now, first the questions. You can also write the question in the chat. This might make it easier to respond. So I have a question actually. Yes. So uh, do you know whether it is possible to uh, develop speech recognition for uh, multilingual scenarios? You know, uh, like interpreted mediated interaction where there is actually code switching from one language to the other. 
Not yet. <laughs> yeah. speech, speech recognition at the moment, I think, is at a at some kind of, how do you call it? At a, at a crossroads. <laughs> yes, exactly, at a crossroads, because the success of industrial speech recognition depends on, uh, is tremendous at the moment, so everybody's using it, but it is going very much far, uh, very much away from what scientists need. As I said before, it tries to smooth the the input or tries to smooth the text and uh, neglect everything that we find interesting. And it has problems with uh, several speakers. It has problems with non-standard speech. It has problems with uh, all kinds of phenomena and code switching going from lang one language to other as humans can do is way out of the reach. So it cannot even really distinguish different speakers very well. So at the moment, yeah, I can say no, it's not within the foreseeable future. It will not work. For this, we might need, perhaps speaker diarization can help because then the assumption is that yeah, but that's not really code switching because one one speaker may change as they often do uh, within their own turn. So no, at the moment, I don't see any uh, any opportunity here or any chance that this will work, unfortunately. Thank you very much. And I, I actually have another question, yes. which might sound particularly naive, or I mean, it's just out of curiosity, if I can ask it. And the question is about privacy policies, because, you know, you, I'm just wondering how you manage privacy policy, policies when you have like sensitive content or, you know, sort of audience where people were asked to sign, you know, particular documents where they're actually allowing um, scholars to use the data. And then, yes. Yeah. Can yes. you just, yeah, thank you. Thank you for asking. It's actually a very important question. Uh, if you're not using ASR or automatic speech recognition, all the data will be held at our local university for 24 hours. Does that, um, Everything that you upload goes to a protected um, part of the file system where only our system administrator has access. You don't see any data of the others. And even we as uh, people working at the Institute do not see this area. So it's, it's hidden. All data will be uh, deleted after 24 hours. This is something we promise and we, this is a promise we keep. If we, uh, access external services like automatic speech recognition. It depends on the service provider. Google for some time has, uh, for some time, time now has promised not to store data. So they will simply process it. And, but with a free license, we get only very small chunks of data that we can process. If we pay, then we are in a position to negotiate with them and ask them not to store the data and not to use it for further work in, to further improve their speech recognition. Other providers are different. So for example, IBM Watson uh, might store the data. You can inform yourself about the use, the uh, data usage in the, when you see these icons, you can have a look at the web page where they uh, define their terms of use. So some of them, store the data to improve their services and others simply processes, but they don't say anything or we don't know anything how long the data will be stored. They simply say, we do not keep it, but does this mean one week or one hour? We don't know. Yeah. And there's related to this, yes, there's a question on the anonymizer. Um, this works, there's not a predefined list. Uh, but when calling the service, I can show you this in a minute. Actually, we can do it if you have this patience, then I will show you how to do this. Actually, you provide a file with the information that you're interested, uh, that you want to be hidden. So this is what we do here. Let's look at the anonymizer. Okay, here you can 
upload the file and I have this little text, so I want to anonymize the words Stranchezza, Instabile, Prosecco, Rapporti and Libero. So in every of these utterances, I want to miss one of these words. Okay, and then I upload. So I have to do this in, in the pipeline, sorry. So I will do the pipeline without automatic speech recognition because I have this already. And I want to go, where's the anonymization? There's so many services now, we need something better here. Okay. For Italian. And now I can select the files. Okay. Oh, now I get an error, probably some format error. Okay, this is interesting because it says I did not get the right file. Ah, yes, it forgot that I gave it a file. No, something else is wrong. Okay, sorry. Uh, <laughs> effect. Yes, exactly. This is the dem <laughs> demo effect. I will promise until tomorrow, but basically what you do Yes, I want it to be too clever now. You provide a file and here you put all the items which you want to remove. I can show you what the result looks like to show that I'm not telling stories. So let's take this sentence. So I had this instabile anonymized and here you can see in, Ge in Germania il tempo è sempre so it's completely removed from the file and this could be done with person names and place names and so on very easily okay may I ask you a question yes of course um, is there any way of, of doing this with videos I mean, like to, 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 to blur the face or something like that? Yes and no. Um, no, it's difficult. And the problem is you're actually recording the video to have the face. Or so the it's body actually. Hmm? Or the body language. Or the body language, but a video without a face, yeah. I think. There's not very much interest in this. So there are uh, attempts to do automatic face recognition and automatic gesture recognition, and then to blur this because it's easy once you know where the things you're interested in are. So because we have mouse and we know where every word occurs, we can simply remove this one word from the audio. If you know where the face is, and you've seen this in TV shows where they do some recordings of criminals and so on, or confidential uh, messages, then you see the face blurred and this can be done automatically. We don't have this in our web services. And as I said, for scientific reasons, it might be, yeah, I don't know whether it's really interesting. Of course, if you're only interested in gesture, but 
mimics is so much part of the visual communication that I don't think that you can leave it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. And we don't have it. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Okay. Maybe some questions might come up during the night. Okay, when everybody everything gets elaborated. And tomorrow at uh, five thirty, we planned a uh, workshop, a mm -hmm. tutorial with Christoph. Does any one of you already know that he or she is interested in participating? And if you have an audio file, then bring it with you. And then we, we can try and work on that during the workshop. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you will have to live with my examples, but it's more fun to use your own recordings. Please write to, into the chat if you are interested to participate. It would be interesting to, to know how many of you will come. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I yeah. know of some people, some students um, and colleagues, they will join us tomorrow and they couldn't make it today. So do you have an idea? So wonderful. Yeah. I'll mm -hmm. see you tomorrow. I'll prepare recording or you, we use your own audio files. Then we use the orthographic transcript with Optra and see how we can integrate recognition and segmentation into the orthographic stuff and even or we can do this separately. So it will be quite dynamic. Uh, we decide on depending on what, you, what you're interested in, what we will do tomorrow. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. And Interesting. I hope to see you again tomorrow. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.